articulate marketing, 20 people, remote working, um, specializing in B2B technology. How did I end up running that business? Well, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, in the 90s, when I was much younger than I am now, um, I set up and ran a computer games company and, and it, it got to about 70 something people and, and I, I sold it in 2000 and I left the business. I left the office on the day I signed the papers, sat in my car and went, right, I am never <laughs> going to employ anyone ever again. Um, and I'm never going to have an office ever again. Famous last <laughs> words. Famous last <laughs> words. Well, the funny thing is I kept one of the promises and I broke the other. I have employees now. Lovely, 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 lovely colleagues. And I, <laughs> but um, I don't have an office. And, and so if you want to know how kind of the, the germ and the genesis of Articulate, it, it was really out of that, that moment where I didn't want to have an office and I wanted to do something where I could be work from home initially and, and as the company has grown in the last four or five years, work from home and let other people work from home or coffee shops or whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason that I didn't want to have an office was it was very expensive. And, um, you know, we had 10, 11,000 square feet and we had, you know, receptionists and cleaners and air conditioning and maintenance and security people and all this stuff. Rates, bloody rates. Oh, all yeah. this, <laughs> my, my wife checks all the time. Um, but th there's a sort of a hidden cost to it as well, which was that um, you have to sort of hire people who can get to that office, which means suddenly you can't hire the best people um, you have to hire the pe best people you can, you know, who live within a reasonable commute. And that was a, that was a limiting factor. So I walked out of that games business and I thought, right, I'm not going to hire people and I'm not going to have an office. And then I thought, what the hell do I do now? Because <laughs> I really, I hadn't had any thought about it. it I had started the business when I was 18 and I had not really a moment thinking that I, I thought they'd carry me out in my coffin. So I, I sat there and I thought, well, I've sold this. I've got nothing to do. And i was acted decisively and creatively and imaginatively. I went and had lunch. <laughs> and then I went for a walk and I thought about it for a bit. I ended up spending the next couple of years sort of as a bit of a dilettante writer. And I wrote for Wired and Popular Science and Director. And I learned to fly and I got, I started reviewing business jets for an American magazine, which is, you know, nice work if you can get it. Mm. Um, and off the back of that, after a couple of years, started getting the occasional corporate job, including one, bless them, with Microsoft. And Microsoft has been a client since 2003. Um, and it started with me selling my games company and thinking it would be a lark to become a writer. Um, so that's the sort of the that's the, the genesis of the company. How did it how did it become how it is today? I, uh, four or five years ago, I broke the first promise and I hired somebody, um, <laughs> Liz my chief happiness officer now as she is today but uh, when i hired her she was my pa um and so she, her career has developed over the last seven eight years um as the company has grown and and then i started hiring writers and you know now here we are lots of people doing lots of clever techie writing and marketing stuff for tech companies does that help is that a good answer that's brilliant <laughs> that is great and i think the genesis, genesis of it all, as I can't say the word, genesis of it all is very similar to many other people I've, I've interviewed, actually, in terms of, you know, you want to give opportunity for people who aren't in the immediate vicinity. Um, you want to be able to, you know, work from home as well, work, I suppose, on your terms for, 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 much, for much of it. And you want to provide a good service. And it seems you've been doing that since 2003 now. And has that always been remotely? Um, yes. All the, all the initial freelance writing and journalism was, was all remote. I've, I've always worked from home since, since 2000. So um, yeah, all, all remote. We don't have an office at all. And everybody who works at Articulate now is remote and they're all over the place. We have, um, I have a colleague in Bucharest, another in Vienna, um, Another one who seems to flit around Canada quite a lot, but spends a lot of his time in the UK, some up in Scotland, some in Wales, all over. Um, and I think that's, I think that's rather lovely. Um, and, 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 and they're an amazing, amazing bunch of people. It just is. It, 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 uh, and here's, here's the funny thing. We, we, as, as the business has grown and we've kind of got a little bit more 
I'd say reputation, but a little bit more to offer and a little bit of a better story to tell for ourselves. It's incredibly appealing, this remote working thing. I mean, we get um, the last week, the last round of in, intern adverts we ran, last intern recruitment, we had 650 applications in wow. a month. And is that typical for you? Because I mean, that's again, that's something that I get from speaking to lots of managers like yourself, lots of lots of business owners like yourself. Is that when you put out an application, people you just get inundated? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think I think because people, some people doesn't suit everyone, want to work in this remote way, want to have that flexibility. Um, I think for us, it's partly that. Um, partly also, I think, as we have grown, we, we've put a lot more emphasis on our company culture. And I th- I'm beginning to think that is now coming across in the way we talk about ourselves and the, some of the things we do. For example, we have a chief happiness officer. Out, you know, In a company of 20 people, that's a very deliberate investment in morale, motivation and engagement. And, and um, we, we became a B Corp last year, which means that we're making a commitment to our community and our stakeholders and to the environment as well as to the bottom line obviously as the owner i care about the bottom line but um people want to belong to something that's sort of aligned with their values and something that is going to let them have some flexibility and freedom and and the the next thing that we're working on we've been working on this all year is towards investors and people so we want to become investors and people certified by the end of the financial year and what that talks to is making an investment in people's careers and in their development and their personal growth so i think i think that uh, all these things are interrelated but it 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 helps us it helps attract people and it helps you know build this amazing culture and how do you do i mean 600 applications are on if that's like a whole lot of applications. How do you deal with so many um, applications in one go? It's very hard because you, you, you want to give everyone a fair shake of the stick. And you also, you know, in, in a small company, you don't have a lot of hours. I mean, mm-hmm. literally, if you've got to make money and do, the, do client work and stuff, everyone, everyone's working at, at, at full capacity. So if I say, here, you know, here, review these 200 CVs, mm-hmm. and like, oh, that's going to come and take me a few hours. Um, dividing up the labor, I do a lot of CV reviews. I, I think perhaps I've got quite an eye for it now in my life. I've, I've seen so many. Um, you develop some heuristics about CVs that are obviously inappropriate. I mean, I have, a fair few of them are from, we do try to recruit in the e- UK or EU. So US applicants or, you know, Australian applicants, we can't, you know, that's too far. It's too difficult. So mm-hmm. that there's, there's a few simple rules like that. But once we get to a long list, and I suppose we had... 35 40 on the long list we had to hire an hr consultancy to just pre-screen them and get the list down to you know a manageable number Mm -hmm. um for interviews and because we interview very intensively we you know we we give people homework and then they meet you know five six people over a course of multiple interviews that's a real time commitment for us so we, we have to really be sure but we had the most amazing candidates i astonishing we had we had a woman who we hired in the end um, who'd done a TED talk, for example, wow. and had been a head teacher, and she was just looking for a second, looking to explore a second career in marketing and writing, and 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 despite being having been incredibly successful in her, her educational career, just said, well, you know, I will come and work as an intern for you, and I'll learn something new, and if it works for everyone, I'll stay. Um, and that you know, and I think that's the sort of thing that it's not just oh, we can work with somebody in Bucharest or Birmingham or Glasgow. It's also, you know, for someone like her who has young children, who's looking for a change of career, looking for something that's a little bit more interesting and quirky and flexible, it, it works really well for her. And we've got something to offer for her. Or another example, we have, um, we just took on a, a, a junior consultant, um, our sort of word for salesperson in some ways, um, although there's a, it's more complicated than that. Anyway, his, his life his passion is parachuting. And he's a parachute instructor, um, and he lives now in the Netherlands, although when we hired him, he was in Italy. And what he does, I'm serious, it's most extraordinary. <laughs> he, he, he works all morning. He bases himself at an airport, sits in their cafe, works all morning, and f- at lunchtime, to relax, 
<laughs> he goes and does a couple of parachute jumps and then he works all afternoon and then just to wind down at the end of the day he goes up and does another couple of parachute jumps well i tell you what <laughs> so, sorry go ahead matthew go ahead no that, i mean i just think that's the most extraordinary thing imaginable but that 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 works for him and now he is in, in a, a dutch airfield doing his job parachuting well, i'll tell you what I always ask the question on my podcast, what's the most unusual or exotic place that you've worked? Um, and uh, Well, the most in- unusual place I've heard so far is the Norwegian fjords. But I think, I think that what you just said, that tops it. That, that's, um, that takes the prize, I think, somebody who goes parachuting uh, um, on lunchtime. Another recent hire we, we hired um, uh, ha- has splits her time between Guernsey and Valencia in Spain and just you know the fact that she she just wants to spend time with her family in 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 these different places and doesn't want to come to London to work but uh, here's the thing it's it, it's not all remote um i mean meaning well it, <laughs> we we spend quite a lot of time and effort and money to bring everyone together so mm-hmm. there, there are regular meetings in London we we would probably have six eight a year a couple of days each everybody we, we can possibly get to come in comes in and, and joins us um and you know we have some social events we have a couple of days of training and discussion and planning or projects and so that that, that we try very hard to form the bonds and that you get in a business and, and 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 i don't think i don't think if if i don't think it would save us any money if we if we um we're not doing it to save money. I think we spend everything we would spend on an office doing all this other stuff, mm-hmm. having having Liz and having the meetings and things. Do you think that's, I mean, because again, um, that's something that a lot of remote businesses try to do. They put a lot of effort into bringing everybody together to have that face-to-face time, if you see what I mean. But is that something that you um, you think is perhaps more important in a remote business as opposed to uh, a co-located business? I, I think it's important in both kinds of business, and it's one of my regrets that I didn't do it more at Intelligent Games, to be honest, and spend more time as a company together rather than as teams or as management. You know, if you run a business, you spend an awful lot of time talking to the same people, you know, team leaders, your bookkeeper, your accountant, your lawyer, you know, the, 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 this sort of stuff. And and what, what the, the company meetings allow us to do is to to kind of, work and meet people who aren't in our team who aren't yes. in our day-to-day contact group um and i think that's that's very very valuable it's it's it, it sort of um f- sparks new ideas and it's a great way to get to know each other and i think um another thing is that as well as that it's working remotely you don't have that, that spontaneity do you in terms of conversation um obviously working in a collocate situation you can you can after work, you can go down the pub, or you can ask your your friends, you know, who's sitting next to you, what's the time, or whatever it is. How else do you get to to sort of like form those bonds and get to know each other? The, the, the Liz does a really good job with that. She has all kinds of little little schemes and things going on. For example, we have an, a, a book club, so we read a book and then we chat about it on Skype, well, on um, Zoom, and. Um, we have happy half hours. So everybody at the end of, you know, Friday afternoon, people go and get a drink and they, you know, whatever they want and they sit in front of their computer and they, you know, have one of these sort of mosaic boxes of everybody talking and chatting. And there's a little bit of, and it's surprising. I, I, I deliberately don't join very many of them, not because I'm antisocial, but I think, <laughs> I think on a Friday afternoon, they probably want to bitch and moan about me as presenting us and i don't want to, i don't want to be like you know that the, like the school teacher who tries to be cool by going to all the kids parties you know but um i, I go to a few of them and the, the, the people quite happily sit and chat for hours and it's really funny and you, and so that that's a that's a lovely thing that happens and um we we also have a company stand up every tuesday morning so everybody's on that call that's it's it's, it's as close to mandatory as we get so there's lots of opportunities to meet people and do things um uh both video conferencing and otherwise but we also have slack like a lot of companies and that the bits of slack that work very well are not the kind of you know 
businessy messagey bits but mm -hmm. there's the, the sort of random chatter and the sort of nonsense that comes up that's very bonding i think and we have a lovely thing that emo emerged spontaneously called the validation channel um mm -hmm. we we a validation center we had a, a prospect that we were trying to sell to about three years ago and they were called the validation center and what they did was a you know hardware and software testing it was a testing company well we never won them as a client but somebody in the company picked up on this name and set up a slack channel called validation center <laughs> um and so you know whenever anyone does anything nice people just say oh you know well done maddie you did this or well done alex you did that and it was really good or thank you for your help with that and it's not me making that happen sort of top down you know employee of the month and all that stuff mm -hmm. it's incredibly organic and spontaneous and and i'm enormously proud of them for it i think that it's it's a lovely i mean i think this is one of the things that i've i've been learning because i'm an old fart really but from from the, the the you know the gen x types um that work in the company the the very um uh, open with their emotions and their gratitude and their respect for people and they you know it's it's rather nice i i like that so yeah they're, they're some of the things we do well i i think you mentioned a word that actually sprung to mind uh, when you were talking just now organic everything seems in your business to happen quite organically and um obviously you you you, you you're managing your team but they're for, for most parts obviously self-managing by the sounds of it and they have their own activities and you you call them a free range team as well don't you a, a free range team <laughs> uh, that's funny yes. how did that come about <laughs> is that because well, that, of that, I, I think i think a lot of that stuff on the about us page um you know they just wrote that um and there's a little video on our about us page that that they made um and that was quite delightful actually because they i just said well somebody wanted we, we wanted a video and i hired a film crew for a day when we were having a company meeting and i put i just said to a couple of people look just make a video and they were in another room just making video and they would grab people and go and i had no idea what they were doing <laughs> um and they just produced that video themselves um as a team and um they also, and this I think is lovely, they made all the music for it as well. There's quite a musical uh, group in the company, lots of different instruments and writers and things. Um, so that sort of thing emerges very naturally. And it, what, what that's very helpful for is, is it, 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 it gives me a sense of how people are. I mean, it gives me a sense of how they are when they're not trying to be polite to the boss a bit. Um, but we do, there's quite a lot of deliberate culture, quite a lot of deliberate work. Um, I, I, and I don't. That doesn't mean it. One has, has to be sceptical or cynical about it. I mean, I think com all companies have a culture, you know. But you get you if you don't work on it and you don't think about it and you don't try and make decisions in the right direction, you get a, perhaps a hostile, a negative, or neutral culture, or you get one where people are disengaged and cynical about it. And you know, I think Liz puts in an enormous amount of work she, just on sort of you might call it pastoral care, checking in with people, mm -hmm. but she also does formal surveys and we have a, a tool called um, Workbot um, that does employee MPS scores um, and that's amazing that so we have there's a sort of a numerical data driven backbone and a, a very sort of soft gentle human front to it mm -hmm. um, we also there's some odd things that we do that are, are deliberate choices but um, People think that we have this organic culture, and sometimes people can say to me, "Oh, you, you know, we're doing this new thing, and it doesn't feel as organic as it used to be." And I'm, and then I say, "What do you mean by that?" And they'll, they'll tell me something that they think was organic and natural in it, and I'm like, "I was in a meeting for four hours before we decided to do that. <laughs> we worked really hard, and you came in, and you think that just is natural, how it it just happens to be like that, and it's not at all. It's <laughs> bloody hard work, you know, and we." agonize agonize sometimes over some of the choices and and god knows we make things we make terrible mistakes and change our mind and do something different um a couple of examples we 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 have a a, a model of measuring work we don't use timesheets and okay. we have gone through several evolutions of this but we measure output uh and using a points pricing points menu thing and we ended up building an app to do this so if, if you write a blog post mm -hmm. you don't go i spent three hours working for this client writing this blog post you go you know one blog post title this this client 
uh, on delivered on this date and it gets logged and there's a sort of a rate card for, for the work. Um, so nobody is being measured by hours, but there is an element in which they're being measured by output. Oh yes. Yeah. And this, this has been, on some levels, that's really attractive. And uh, you know, companies, people who've never worked in a sort of billable hours environment don't know what a terrible load of BS that is and all the politics that can come with it. And they just assume that what we do sometimes is a terrible load of BS with a lot of politics that come with it. And I go, well, yeah, but it could be <laughs> so much worse. So, but we, 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 had a, we had some fairly painful lessons as we sort of adopted that and kind of thinking about the culture of how we use it not to build clients or to plan work but how we use it to plan work force you know how many people we need yes. to hire yeah. and how we measure people's performance and what role does it play in appraisals and and so on and 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 kind of there's been some misunderstandings about it so that that that's that's an example of something where something that looks from the outside now, if I told you the positive spun version of that, oh, we use points, we don't do billable hours, it's everyone logs their work and we can, you know, we can do this and we can see that. And, you know, uh, and it's very good now. It's mm -hmm. a good positive thing and it's, uh, people appreciate it, but it hasn't always been that way. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, from you mentioned all those things about how your culture has, has evolved, for, you know, from the bottom up and how you become a B Corp, how you've, you're attracting pe the right sort of people. It does take a lot of hard work behind that. And I think it, it, from when I looked at your website and I, I, I got the inkling as well that I wanted to interview because of all of that, I, I got a sense that there was something about Articulate that I, I liked. And I think a lot of businesses can probably take note of this because if, if you look at um, articulatemarketing.com, there's a lots of things on there. There's lots of information that gives you an understanding of who they are, how they work, not just what they do. It's all about why as well, why they do what they do. And I think that in itself has, has led to them receiving 600 plus applicants to a job and a, a TED applicant and people, you know, building a team that just sounds... You've got you've got a real really cohesive team by the sounds of, of things. Um, we try. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's. I have to take my hat off to you, and I think a lot lots of people who may be skeptical about, you know, putting together remote teams. This is this is a great example of of the hard work it takes to build a team, but the fact that it is possible, and you know what what the outcomes can be from all the hard work. And you mentioned. Um, uh, Martin, you mentioned some mistakes. Are there any other mistakes along the way that you perhaps, if you, if you look back now, you think to yourself, actually, we we should perhaps sort of done taken a different mm -hmm. a different tack to doing that certain thing. The, 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 there's an ongoing issue challenge, mm -hmm. which is around um, discussing and capturing our culture. So you know. 90% of culture is what you do. What happens around here? You know, how, what instincts or preferences or principles you use to make decisions. It's not what's written down in a book, right? That's not culture. But there is value in writing something down in a book. There is value in trying to capture and distill it. You onboard new people and you kind of want to explain it. You want to put it on the website. You it's a requirement for, for investors and people certification. Mm -hmm. And we have been through a couple of fairly mm -hmm. lengthy exercises in the history of the company working on our culture and documenting it. And a couple of them have been very successful when we were smaller. Um, the last attempt, and the, there were specific unique reasons why it didn't work so well, but it didn't work so well. And it ended up being a little bit, feeling a little bit unfinished, a little bit uncomfortable. Not, not any like people were cross or cynical, but I think, I think there were a lot of passionate views about things and everybody wanted to put something into it. And a few people wanted to kind of like, I want the culture to documentation to say this kind of thing. And I want it to say this kind of thing. I want it to be that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we didn't quite spend the time we needed just to, to land it. And, and there, I, as I say, there are good and specific reasons why that happened. Um, but it, it, rem, it, it reminds me of the obvious point, which is if you, 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 all of it takes work, you can't just 
blithely go, oh, well, we're going to work on Thursday on our company culture and write something down. I mean, everybody has opinions and ideas and thoughts and everyone has, a, in some ways, it's a tribute to the fact that people are passionately invested in the future of the company. They care so much because mm -hmm. most of these, in most companies, that kind of culture workshop stuff is like, <sighs> you know. Um, so we, 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 what we've actually just done is we, the, the woman who helped us with our company culture three, four years ago um, now has a full-time job doing something in, as, in HR in a very big corporation. And we've done a deal with her boss. <laughs> we will give two days of marketing advice if, if we can have her for two days to run our, nice. our culture workshop next year. So we've pulled her back in. <clears throat> um, and we're, we're, we're going to have another, another go at that. To, to really try and dig into it um so <laughs> that works you know i'm looking forward to that um but I, I i i you can't phone it you can't phone this stuff in i think that's that's the observation you have to put you have to put in the hours and yeah. you have to let people have their say and you have to work through the pain a little bit i think it, it's very easy to to reduce pain by you know for me as the boss by exercising my, you know, I'm the boss and we're doing it like this. Mm -hmm. Whenever I do that, not whenever I do, if, if I do it solely for the purpose of bringing a difficult conversation to an end, that never works. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to lean into the pain a little bit. And about culture, I mean, there's a big topic of conversation now in the remote world, not just the remote world actually, but hiring people that, that actually, I suppose, fit or a culture fit. I, I don't. I don't like that expression. But hiring people that that I just don't like it. But how do you how do you know when somebody's right? Because I mean, at the top of the call, you mentioned that okay, not everybody is suited to remote work. That's that's mm -hmm. that's one thing. But how then do you from these six hundred applicants, you've narrowed it down to say I don't know um, ten. Mm -hmm. How do you know who's going to work? Right. Uh, you don't always know. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, but you don't always know works in both in two directions. It, 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 most people try to reduce the risk by hiring people that are more like themselves or more like people who've been successful or, you know, relying on a, apparently objective factors like education or experience. Yes. When those things are probably easier to test in a CV or an interview, but they aren't necessarily indicative of whether someone's going to be any good. So what do we try and do? Well, yes, you're absolutely right. We're trying very hard to weed out people who are not going to be comfortable working on their own. So we do a lot of, we give them people homework for every interview. Um, you know, they have to write a blog or they have to do some, if it's a sales consultancy role, they have to do some analysis on something. So we can see whether they're capable of hitting a deadline, reading a brief, understanding something, giving us something back. And we try very hard to do that before we've spoken to them very much because, we, you know, we then look at their work. Another thing that we do is a very small thing, but actually incredibly helpful. On our applicant management system, we ask, yeah, send your CV, send a cover letter, whatever, whatever, whatever. But we ask three questions. For example, what are you geeking out about at the moment? And if you could be doing anything at the moment, what would you be doing? And it, it, they, sound, they sound a little bit cliche interview questions. But what we're interested in is, is given an application form for a job that you might like to do, how much thought are you going to put into what you write? Are you going to write? Oh, the, the third mm. one is in, a, in, in 280 characters, a tweet. Tell us why we should hire you. Which is a bit, bit of a sneaky test of people's ability to write. Easy um, said and done. <laughs> yeah. So, but the, these questions, when I'm reviewing CVs, that's what I look at first. So I go to those questions, and if someone just puts, it leaves them blank. Ah. Oh, dear. No. If someone puts in something sort of vacuous, I don't like it when people mention t bland TV shows, because it just doesn't show enough imagination. They're not engaged in the world enough. And if it, you know, love, what are you geeking out about? Love Island. <laughs> what I want is someone who's actually geeking out about something, like really in, passionately. In, yeah. So we're looking for attributes of, of behavior and attitude and life skills. So we want people who are curious about the world, people who have the ability to self-motivate to learn a new thing. Parachute jumping, right? 
people who are you know got a bit of get up and go about them people who've got a hit for when remote working people who have their own hinterland their own life outside work they're not expecting work to be all their friends and all their social life they have friends family hobbies sure. activities there so you know we're looking for that we like it when we see good academics but we don't all, we don't hire on academics but what that says to us is when people have applied themselves intelligently to something but we've hired well we haven't hired yet because they won't release her from from the she we, we wanted to hire and offered a job to a woman who works in the armed services mm-hmm. and and not not an enormous academic career went in at, at 18 but um, an amazing military career and has has had management and leadership training has had writing training for her work very intelligent very insightful about what she when we, and it it was it came across very clearly in her cv and it came across in her answers and it came across in her cover letter uh, when when the military release her we're hiring her in a heartbeat same with same with our former head teacher we you know actually she had got an academic thing but it was in you know it's pgce 20 years ago that's not really a qualification for marketing, but a mm-hmm. TED talk, hell yeah. Of course. We'll hire that. Of so, course. you know, we're looking for those kinds of things. And you can see it very quickly in a CV. Someone's actually done something interesting and, 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 and had a bit of a life. Um, then we interview a lot. I mean, they, they, they meet a lot of people before we hire them. At, so one, one other thing, one other thought. <laughs> no, please, please. Um, Wherever we can, we start people as interns. And we give them three months on the job training. We put put a lot into the internships, but it gives everybody a chance to see whether it's right for them before we commit to a full time permanent role and they commit to full time remote working. And is your um, in terms of your strategy? Is it is it more of an in in terms of your hiring? That is, is it more inbound or outbound? Because I know it's when I look when I look at your website that. There is, um, I, I think when I, when I first contacted you, I mentioned about the, the under-repre- under-representation in, in tech, um, especially of, of women. And you've got, your team is probably, what, 70% women? 60%, is it? Yeah, it's, it, but uh, uh, if, if women are underrepresented in tech, and I think that is probably borne out by the statistics, and mm-hmm. certainly we, we I was talking to Angie about this and women going into STEM subjects is very, very underrepresented. Mm-hmm. I remember in my computer games company, we had two women working for us, one, one woman programmer and a graphic designer, which was terrible out of th- at that time, 30, 40 people. But, but th- it was a representation of this lack of women coming in, lack of applicants, lack of, uh, but it was, it was enough to, enough for cosmopolitan to write a feature <laughs> article about them so we really? were, we were the, i don't know if we were the only computer games company in cosmo but we were certainly one of them um which which i think is extraordinary even looking back on it now it seems extraordinary that it should be so remarkable but yes okay women are underrepresented in tech true um i think men are i think there's a slightly less extreme but slight gender imbalance in marketing and in my anecdotal experience of 15 years in marketing there's probably slightly more women than men so i think we actually rep we i think we reflect our gender imbalances in our industry not right. not we're not doing a great job of getting women into tech we're doing you know an inadequate job perhaps of getting men into marketing i'm afraid i i, I, I yeah mm, yeah i don't know i have to be careful about this because i'm not sure it's completely true it's only my instinct on this yeah i have a similar instinct to you and um and I don't know, it's, it's, it's something that's, that's close to my heart because I've got, you know, two girls who really are passionate about both market, well, not marketing, but tech. They kind of gravitate towards the, the, the tech things. And my, my, my family, my fa- family are in, in STEM subjects. And so it's something that was passionate that I, I'd, again, I'd noticed about your, um, about the visuals on your website. But um, I think you're doing a, a great job in terms of your team, building your team, building your business, uh, growing as well. And just one, I suppose, one well, a couple of last questions for you in terms of um, managing. I mean, again, lots of hiring, ma- lots of managers in general, they who who perhaps in a co-located business, they have, I suppose, a I, suppose, I don't know if it's mistrust when it comes to 
allowing people to 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 work remotely, and there's there's still a bit of skepticism, oh, yeah. skepticism there, isn't there? What what advice would you give to them um, in terms of you know again building a team? You've got twenty in your team, building a team that's again cohesive and is mm. just just right on the ball. It yes. I, I was I wrote an article about this a couple of years ago, and I just saw it again yesterday, looking through an old blog. Um, and the the title was a bit provocative: "Managers care about absenteeism, but leaders care about presenteeism." Um, and the thought that that rather glib headline sort of captures is: if you're a kind of insecure manager you know, the thing that you can control, and if you're insecure, you're interested in control, mm -hmm. is whether or not John or Jane are sat in their desk at, you know, six o'clock working on your project. Whether they are or not, and whether it helps to have them there working late, or whether it matters if they come in at 10 o'clock in the morning and go at seven o'clock or come in at 6 a.m. and go at four, or work remotely, you know, but the thing that you can control is, can I see them? Are they there? And there are definitely, in, you know, insecure managers who want that level of control. And I, I've come across them in my life. I've certainly heard about them. I, um, I, my wife had a manager who, who, if ever she booked a day off to work from home, would book immediately like a call at nine o'clock to make sure she was sat at her desk, wow. you know, on some spurious pretense. And, and, you know, would, it would come up behind her in, in, her, in the office and look oh, at her screen no. and see what she's working. And it, it all seemed a, a, a same sort of package of insecure kind of control freak behavior. So I think, I think the, the answer has to be something about trust. I think the answer has to be, I'm going to give up the control of hours and presence, and I'm going to gain some control through relationships through trust through expectation setting by providing context by having the difficult conversations about productivity if someone's output isn't as it should be but you know assuming that they're going to do a good job and assuming if they're working from home they're working right i mean mm -hmm. and Here's, here's the flip side of that. If you, if you make force people to commute every day, and in London that means you know, 10 hours a week commuting yeah, for most people, if you let them work from home, you're probably going to get most of those 10 hours for work. I mean, everybody you talk to who has to commute, oh, I love working from home because I get so much done. The phone doesn't ring and I don't have to bloody commute. And then they feel guilty because they've got to work, you know, they're not out in the office. So they work really hard. So, you know, my experience is you let people work from home, you remote work, they actually you get much more out of them. They're mm -hmm. much more productive. Um, so trusting in that, um, one of the things that we do, I think, as I mentioned, was we, we measure output rather than hours. And that, that's a very profound. The other thing that people find really hard to deal with, we don't set deadlines. So wow. people understand sometimes when client work has to be done by a certain date, you know, there's an event or a website launch or whatever. Well, you know that, you know, if you're working on a project, you know what the key dates are, if there are any. If there and people understand also we have to deliver a certain amount of work for a client every month as a program and a schedule. But I'm not going to tell you you need to do this by Friday and then you need to do the next thing by Wednesday and the thing after that by Friday. If I have set this up and communicated the context correctly, you know what needs to be done this week. You know what needs to be done next week. And I'll leave it up to you to manage your time, your schedule, your workload, your planning to get the right work done at the right time for the client. And that I think is, I explain, try and explain this to some clients. And they go, you don't, you, I need deadlines. I want a table. I want, when am I getting my, I said, you get it by the end of the month. It's all, it'll come. It's like Wagamama. You'll get it when it's ready and you'll get everything and it'll be fresh. But that, that's very, I think that's probably at the cutting edge of, 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 of remote working right now for me, getting people to accept. And it's interesting because people come into the company and they want me to set deadlines for them. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. You've got to figure your own stuff out. That's your workload. So, actually, this is this is, and I, I promise I'll shut up. No, this is great. I love this. The 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 that thing about setting deadlines it can cause some stress for people, right? Meaning, if they've just got a heap of work and they don't know what to do first, and so we do have to do some training. We have to talk to people. And we have to communicate about how to manage, 
your task list and how to communicate with your boss saying, I'm not going to get that done because, or, you know, I've got too much to do this week. I've got these five things on my to-do list and I can do th any three of them. You know, what's the most important thing for you, account manager, for me to get done for, you know, those kind that that those are life skills and those are valuable things that that none of that nothing is going to be solved by going me telling you what your deadline is except 50 percent of the time you'll miss the deadline and then everybody will get stressed out about it well i'll tell you what um that was the voice of uh, matthew or that this is the voice of matthew Stibber, um on the remote world Life podcast he's the ceo of articulate marketing and i would listen back to this if you're if you're in management if you're building a remote business then this is just gold because it's, it tells you about not just the, the, the trust issues, the culture issues, the everything when it comes to building a remote team, building remote business, and one that has been successful for the last, what, well, since 2003. So have a listen back to this recording. Matthew, I just really want to say thank you for your time. And we'll be looking out for uh, what articulate marketing is doing in the future. In fact, what, what's on the horizon for Articulate Marketing? <laughs> well, we just launched an app last week, um, hubtoolkit.com. So anyone who's using HubSpot, it's a tool that makes HubSpot, you know, does SEO and social media things in HubSpot more efficiently. Um, and we're working on the new version of our points app, um, which will eventually surface in our um, application turbinehq.com, which does purchase orders, expenses, and time off requests. Wow. So besides being a marketing company, we also geek out on this other stuff. And geeking out is what you can look forward to from Articulate. Sounds good. And where can we find that across at articulatemarketing.com? Or is, is there another domain that you want me to share with the audience? Um, articulatemarketing.com has a tools page, and everything we do that's not Articulate is on there. Matthew, thank you so much for your time. It's been great talking to you and I'll be following and watching with a keen eye to see what Articulate Marketing is getting up to in the future. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you.